Hey, this is Tyler from Macro Ops, and this week's market sit rep is entitled Reach for Yield. So in this particular episode, we're going to go through four things. We're going to look at the bottom picking going on at high yield energy, just kind of investigate what's going on over there, what are the big boys doing. Then we're going to look at bond duration. I know that's sort of a fancy term, but we're going to break it down to its most simple components and just look at you know, what could bond prices do given a raising of yield or raising of interest rates or lowering of interest rates. Then we're going to look at the fate of the classic 60-40 portfolio, which probably not going to perform like it has in the last 30 years in the next 30 years and then finally we're going to quickly cover currency chop so in the bottom picking section here's the background no one has made much money in the last 18 months i don't know about you guys but if you look at for me if you look at the passive portfolios that i have they haven't been doing too much okay and they continue to find you know a lot of investors are saying ah you know it's not making much money. I need to make money. They get antsy. So they go out. And what do they do? They, they pile into high yield products. All right. They're sick of guessing where stocks are going. They just want some high interest rate or high yield. And the popular choice has been getting in those beaten down energy companies that have the super high dividend yields. We know that energy sold off a lot in January, Q1 of 2016. It came back, crude rallied. Now everyone's saying, yay, the bottom is in and we can jump in and take control of these high yields. So this looks like a newer investment theme for this year, but really it's not. I mean, just look at this graph. Bank of America, Merrill Lynch uh, produced this, and we have a dividends fund, MLPs, REITs, and high yield line in blue, and then tips in gold and red, just to show you how much this stuff has just absolutely skyrocketed since the great financial crisis. People have been starved for yield, and so they're just piling, piling, piling into MLPs, dividend funds, REITs, high yield, et cetera. And tips in gold, you know, kind of have lost their favor so Bank of America is saying, hey, they're showing signs of fatigue. And yeah, it is. But a lot of investors are coming in and buying this dip here, especially in the MLP space. So we're interested in the high yield energy space as well, but feel like it's just a little too early. We'd like to see a little more blood in the streets, prefer another washout near prior lows. Just got to make this trade a little less crowded because okay? we still think that the strong dollar is going to is going to continue trend and that's going to put crude oil and other energy products back to lows and it's going to probably kick off one more wave of defaults clean out the last bit of zombie companies and then we can be confident and get pick up some high yields so now we're going to transfer into david tepper's 13f this is going to give us some mlps we at least want to put on our radar he's betting now that these things are going to pay out uh, we're not following him into this trade quite yet but some people may have different opinions and want to get into energy now so here's what tepper's doing and if you guys don't know who Tepper is, you know, he's a billionaire hedge fund manager. He's been calling the market great since the financial crisis. He's made tons of money off of the Fed's actions and basically just buying the market big time. But uh, anyway, here are his top buys from the latest 13F. You can see both of these are MLPs, Energy Transfer Partners and Williams Partners. We're going to cover that story here in a second. And they're also some of his most concentrated holdings. Let's see it again, Williams Partners and ETP right here. So we got ETP, Energy Transfers Partners, WPZ, Williams Partners, and both focus on midstream services. If you don't know what midstream is, if you're unfamiliar to oil and gas space, we got upstream, which is exploration production, midstream, which is transportation, and then downstream, which is processing and distribution. So midstream is more or less pipelines. They just connect people from drilling, the people that drill the oil out of the ground to the people that process it and sell it to the consumer. It's a pretty solid dividend space usually, but it does come with its problems. But Tepper is definitely focusing on midstream right now. So here's the chart of energy transfer partners. We can see they started to get hurt in 2015 here, now since bounced back and recovered. And they have 11.49% dividend yield right now. It's pretty, pretty high. Uh, and just a little background on this company. They started natural gas pipelines and now expanded into diversified portfolios, including Nat gas liquids, refined products, and crude oil, and they are a master limited partnership. And then the other player is Williams Partner. And you guys can see here again in 2015, it started to break down. We have since formed a little bottoming pattern and then broken out from that. So they have a 10.82% dividend yield, which looks mighty juicy, mighty attractive to everyone out there who's not earning anything in their accounts. And they mainly focus on dry gas pipeline transport, so mostly in that gas space. And they're a master limited partnership as well. But here's the rub. So why are these paying such a high dividend? Well, they're, obviously there's a risk to them. So will they be able to pay these dividends if energy prices revisit the lows? Right? 
they're leveraged. They obviously have uh, debt payments, debt servicing to take care of. And if that runs out of hand and they have to service that debt, they're, they're going to have to cut the dividend. So WPZ's credit rating is currently BAA3, which is Moody's credit rating. It's one above junk debt. And Energy Transfer Partners is at BBB minus, which is also one rating right above junk debt. So the f a further downgrade from here in, in the junk debt territory is, is probably going to jeopardize this dividend. Right? That means their cost to borrow is going to go up and it's going to be much, much harder for them to service those fat, fat, juicy dividends floating around 11%. So what, what they're doing, and we can kind of see what Tepper's playing here, is the parent companies of both these MOPs are try actually trying to complete a merger right now. So they're betting that a merger between the two would be successful. There's going to be some synergies there between both of them, and then the odds of maintaining the dividend payment for them both are going to go up. So shareholders vote in Williams about this, and it's going to happen before the end of June. Here's the market sentiment. This is the spread of the trading price of Williams Company to the value of the deal. And basically, when this chart goes up, it means the market's getting more antsy that the deal will not complete. And as it goes down, they are more confident. So as you can see here, we got the deal is getting more and more confident by investors. So Tepper's obviously all in on this, thinking that this deal is going to complete and he's going to be able to sit on two nice MLPs that are going to pay out fat dividends and appreciate highly in price on the other side. All right, that's it for MLP section. Now let's move into bond duration. And you know, bond duration, it's, it's boring. It's a lot of math involved. It it's, can be complex, but we're going to really break it down and simplify it. So what duration basically means is longer term bonds, bonds that are going to mature farther out in time are more sensitive interest rate changes than shorter term bonds. And then there's also a coupon layer of complexity you can add onto that. So bonds with higher coupons are less sensitive to rates than bonds with low coupons. And just to refresh your, we got to remember that as rates go up, bonds go down. It's an inverse relationship. So if rates go down, bond prices are going to rally. Now, here's where the asymmetry comes in. So although we feel like government bonds are going to be bid up in the next couple of years, we're still expecting that deflation scenario to pay out. Ten years out, you know, long-term investors need to expect some drawdowns on the bonds with long duration because rates can only go so negative. Okay, they can only go so negative. And, these and the, the bonds with a lot of time to mature are going to be most sensitive to when rates finally revert back to somewhat of a mean and get back into meaningful positive territory again. So I'm going to go to a Wall Street Journal graphic here. It's very interesting. We're going to walk through a couple of exercises and thought exercises about what can happen to bonds given a rate change. All right, so here's the interactive calculator. It's really cool. We're going to be able to solidify the concepts of bond duration more, but also look like look at what, what are these bonds, different bonds going to do if we have a change in interest rates. So here's the slider up here. We can see we have Italy, Germany, U.S., Japan, France, all with different terms. Ten-year, ten-year. Italy's the five-year. We also build a custom bond, which we're going to do in a second. Watch how if we go down half a percentage point from here, we can see a rally in all the bonds. And the 40-year and the 50-year, they're going to go up 20%, 18%. So you can see that these longer-dated ones are much more sensitive than the shorter-dated bonds. Now, this is what I'm talking about, though, when if we just have a, a move down, how big of a mark-to-market loss we can have on some of these bonds. So let's say we rates around the world increase by 1%. You know, you're going to see a, almost a 10% drawdown in, in the bond portfolio of people holding German 10 years or U.S. 10 years. And, I mean, look at these longer-dated ones, 27%, 25% drawdowns in the price of the bonds. And that's just an interest rate rise of 1 percentage point. Now, if we go up to 2 or even 3 it gets pretty ridiculous. So that this is what we're talking about when we say, you know, there's an asymmetry here. There's just a lot more room for these things to fall than to go up. And before we we go back to the slides here, we're going to look at just how changing the coupon and then also the duration affects a bond. So I said that the a longer a the longer out a bond's due to mature, the more sensitive it is to an interest rate movement. So Let's take this custom bond and start jacking up the term here. And you can see as we jack up the term, a 1% percentage point up affects the bond that much more. We jack down the term, goes down. And then coupons, let's see, we put this up to a 2%. 
you can see how it's affected less. The more coupon, the larger of a coupon the bond has, the less it's affected by interest rates. So that's basic bond duration math. Okay, and now we're going to segue that discussion of bond duration. We saw how bonds can change in response to interest rate changes to the fate of the 60-40 portfolio. And on the 60-40 portfolio, it's the classic stock bond mix, 60% equities, 40% fixed income. It was vented a long time ago. A lot of people are still in this portfolio mix. Now, what we're seeing in the future is that there's going to be mean reversion to the performance of the 60-40 portfolio. So bonds have been killing it the last five years. All right, they've had very good performance, and that makes them fragile going forward. And stocks too. All right, stocks have been killing it for the last five years, and that also makes them fragile going forward. So here's some summary statistics from the period of 2010 to 2016. We got S and P 500 long-term rates, the 10-year, and then the 60/40 mix. So let's get the pointer out. You can see that obviously these numbers are very good, and combined the compound annual growth rates around 9.88% with a pretty low standard deviation. So when you take the return minus the risk free rate over the standard deviation of the portfolio, you get something called a sharp ratio. And a high sharp ratio is good. The higher the better, the lower the worse. So you can see 60-40, that bond mixture has a 1.3 sharp ratio from 2010 to 2016. That's very, very good. You know, most hedge funds, quantitative hedge funds, are looking for something around one. And you can see, you'll see here in a second, historically why just passive, passively holding these types of products do not produce anything near 1.3. So here are the stats from the 46, 1946 to present, and this is, they just took the 60-40 here. Return 8.5, excess return 4.1, standard deviation 8.9, and look at the sharp ratio. That's only 0.45, much, much lower than that 1.3 we saw from the last five years. So what are the implications? Well, there's just going to be some painful years ahead for investors as this sharp ratio reverts back to the mean. Okay, so if in the last 60 years or longer, even 70 years, you know, we've seen this portfolio perform at a sharp of 0.45, and now it's performing at 1.3, what kind of sharp ratios do we need to print in the next 10 years to get that to maintain back down into the historical average? It's going to be pretty bad. So there's two, there's two scenarios that are going to play out here. If the inflation scenario plays out, we're going to see that massacre in, the, massacre in the bond market. And we looked at that Wall Street Journal calculator and we saw how if rates go up because of inflation, then bonds are going to get killed. So there are going to be a huge marked market losses in bond markets. If the deflation scenario plays out, that performance drawdown is going to come from stocks. And we still think right now that deflation scenario is the higher probability one in the next year or so. We're still watching things closely, but we st we're still betting on the deflation scenario playing out. But the, the, inf the inflation scenario is still another, is something that could absolutely happen, but it's, it's not as likely as the deflation scenario. And now let's move on to currency chop. People have been getting absolutely cut up to pieces in this market. And this is the big update in the currency market. So we had, you know, the dollar sell off basically since the beginning of 2016. Everyone's saying, oh, the dollar bull market is over, the, you know, that we're going to resume. And so people were coming down to the support line and everyone was shorting into it. And then what happened? Boom, the shorts got absolutely squeezed. The dollar came out. This is what we call a bear trap when we peak below prior lows, an important level, and then squeeze back above. And now the dollar looks like it's it's going to be able to resume its trend again. So it could come up and chop, but the dollar bull trend's still in play, and it's creating a lot of problems for market participants. It's been very confusing lately. And you can see here in gold, since the dollar is strengthening lately, it's just falling off a cliff here from almost up to 1300 down to 1222. We actually broke this out of this little flag pattern, and so gold could be gearing up for a substantial retrace down to this 1180 to 1160 area. And that wouldn't be completely out of the question here just because we had such a large run up without any pullback. You can see all the air in the chart here. So that's a definite possibility. And we wrote about this bull trap in gold that could potentially take place way, way back in the beginning of the year. And we haven't really gone anywhere. We've just chopped around at highs, but that could potentially play out. The dollar does resume trend. It's going to be very interesting to watch here. Can gold keep bid if the dollar's bid as well? So be on the lookout for that. And that's it for this week. Thanks for listening to the Market Sit Rep. If you like the presentation, subscribe to the YouTube channel 
or you can follow us at macro-ops.com. We also have a Twitter account. You can see on the page here at MacroOps, we have a Facebook group, Global Macro Investing. Just type that into the Facebook search bar, and we're also on StockTwits, the handle of at Alex underscore. Thanks for listening to this week's Market Sit Rep, and I'll see you soon. Mm-hmm.